going crazy. They're jumping on each other. One of the most unbelievable finishes you will ever see. And welcome to it. Thanks for being with us here on Orioles Magic, the podcast. Brett Hollander and Jeff Arnold, ready to rock and roll. And Jeff, I'm very excited about our guest today. I don't really know how to put this. This is going to come across kind of weird. He's not the Forrest Gump of Orioles history because he was such a really good player. Not that Forrest Gump wasn't you know, very talented in all the main things he did, but he's someone who just was oddly involved in a 10-year period in every meaningful moment in club history in, 10, in a 10-year window. Yeah, he did so many different things. He had all those grand slams, most in Orioles history. He had two different walk-off grand slams. He had two grand slams in a game. Uh, This is a guy that caught opening day at Camden Yards. Chris Hoyles has done a little bit of everything. He's been everywhere. He caught great pitching staffs. He worked with future Hall of Famer and Mike Mussina. And he'll have a lot of stories, I'm sure, for us. Yeah, Chris Hoyle's coming up. Someone who played 10 years in Baltimore, an Orioles Hall of Famer, 151 career home runs, which may not jump off the page to some of you out there listening. But the reality is, for a catcher uh, who played for that many years, that is an impressive number. And, Jeff, even for your sabermetric friends, I think they'd be impressed. 833 career OPS, 366 career OBP, took a ton of walks, really knew the strike zone and had some really big, powerful years behind the home plate. And he did it in in tough conditions uh, in the Baltimore Heat, where uh, you and I were talking about this before off air. The reality is, uh, and and I love the guy, and I think he's an integral part to several really important and good Orioles teams. But Matt Wieters, in in an eight-year period, basically hit 113 or so home runs. And, And Matt might eclipse 151. I think he's at like 147 right now playing for St. Louis. Uh, But it's really hard to get to that number as a catcher. It's really hard to be a two-way catcher. Because you're behind the plate every day and you have to try and figure out the, the different pitchers on your staff and build relationships with them. You're your catcher and your psychologist and your best friend. And sometimes you're the guidance counselor of the, of the team. You have so many different roles as a catcher that you have to fulfill. And that's why you don't see so many of those catchers that not only do a good job behind the plate, but can also contribute offensively like Hoyles was certainly able to. And in the, in the game that, that we're talking about uh, where he hit the grand slam off of Norm Charlton to win that game, uh, there were 41 hits up to that point in that ball game. And Chris Hoyles hadn't really been involved at all. Uh, and then he comes up to bat, goes to a 3-2 count, hits a grand slam that is forever going to be playing uh, on the video board at Camden Yards. It's definitely top five all time. It's one of those moments you dream about in your backyard growing up playing baseball. The, just the whole setup, as you said, Jeff, and it was an amazing moment. I remember exactly where I was on my parents' couch uh, growing up. And I must say this, Hoyle's career kind of spans the rise of my fandom. Uh, the Orioles trade for him. He makes his big league debut in the Why Not season of 89. He uh, is the starting catcher when they closed down Memorial Stadium. He's the opening day catcher and the starting catcher in 92, open at the ballpark and catches Rick Sutcliffe's uh, shutout. You know, in that time, he's Mike Mussina's catcher. I mean, he was a starting catcher, but he and Mussina, and we'll get into this with Chris, they have this incredible rapport. And then, you know, he's the catcher when Jeffrey Mayer took the ball away. Uh, He's the catcher when the Orioles beat Randy Johnson twice in four games in the 97 ALDS. He had the walk-off, as we were talking about, in 96. Hits a home run in 21-30 in 95. Starting catcher on 21th is involved in almost, you know, every meaningful moment in that uh, 10-year era. So uh, in that 10-year run in that decade. So a uh, really exciting conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll get into everything with Chris, including Mucina and Scott Erickson, Sinker and Cal and, and all of these things we'll have coming up, Jeff. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's a great conversation. And also kind of what Rick Suckliff meant to him in teaching him how to call pitches and how to manage a pitching staff because uh, 96 and 97, not only did you have great offenses in those years, I mean, that 96 team, you had 10 different players that hit 10 home runs or more. But you had some pretty great pitchers, especially you, know, you go to 97 and that year where Mussina, Erickson, Jimmy Key were able to, to lead your team and, and you probably don't get quite as much productivity out of those guys if you don't have a pretty solid backstop and Chris Hoyles put the fingers down. 
Well, let's get to it. Let's get to Orioles Hall of Famer Chris Hoyles here on Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite. Well, I am very excited about our next guest here on Orioles Magic, the podcast. He is really one of the all-time best Oriole catchers. He slugged 151 home runs over 10 seasons in Baltimore and was involved in some of the Orioles' biggest moments in that decade of being the Orioles' backstop. Joining us right now, Orioles Hall of Famer Chris Hoyles. Chris, how are you? I'm doing well, Brett. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to see you. You know, we, we, we want to talk about this game, which I'm going to guess is probably, as far as Jumbotron replays at the ballpark, probably top five all time. A walk-off grand slam is cool, but you did it when the club was down by three, bottom of the ninth inning, you know, full house, of course, in 1996. This goes back to May of 1996. It's three and two. I say this is the moment that we all envision we'd be in in our backyard. Down by three, full count, base is loaded, and it takes a, a walk-off to, to end the night. Yeah, that's pretty, much, uh, that's pretty much everything. And I think as a kid, we used to do that as well. Uh, you know, in the backyards, and uh, you know, I was actually able to live it in real life and at the uh, at the major league baseball level, and you know, that, that was actually a really crazy game. And you know, I think A Rod uh, Alex Rodriguez hit a grand slam earlier in the game uh, that put them on top, and then I was able to come up later on uh, with all that uh, three-two count off Norm Charlton. And, uh, you know, hit the game winner. Take us back through that A.B. against Charlton, because in addition to the, the grand slam that, that A-Rod hit, you also had Jay Buhner hit the home run as well. And so you eventually got to the point where two outs, base is loaded, and then you come to the plate. Well, you know, the, 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 the cool thing about Norm is we actually ended up getting Norm. And – you know, Norm, Norm was a very good big league pitcher, a uh, very good closer. And, you know, he had a really good split-fingered fastball, and everybody knew it. He, he liked to use it and could throw it for strikes at any time. So, you know, that's what made Norm so so tough uh, as a hitter was you never knew when he was going to throw that splitty. Um, and he actually did it in that at-bat. Uh, that's actually what I did hit out was a split finger fastball that just kind of hung up up in the zone but uh you know the at bat was uh was actually a good one fought off a few pitches and you know was able to get to the three two count and uh like i said he hung the split finger didn't do a whole lot and uh, i was able to put it in the seats for a game winner and while we're on the subject of charlton obviously he's one of the nasty boys had a long great big league career but he comes to baltimore a few years after you take him deep to end the game but he's also oddly involved in like a couple of big brawls in club history, including that famed 1993 one, which people don't talk about enough. It is on YouTube, I will say. And, you know, that is probably one of the longest brawls in, in, in history. And I know you didn't start that day. Jeff Tackett did when, when Mike hit Bill Hasselman. But I have this distinct recollection of Norm bloodied all over with like no shirt on in the middle of the diamond at Camden Yards. I mean, the guy seemed like an animal. Oh, he was. And we actually had a few of them. I mean, you know, another name that comes to mind is Randy Myers. I mean, you know, I guess when you're a closer and you're left-handed, uh, that kind of runs there. But, uh, you know, Randy had that mentality and so did Norm and they didn't back down. And, uh, you know, Norm got right in the middle of it, as did Randy. And, you know, they just didn't shy away from anything. And I think the closer mentality, uh, you know, that's a mentality that you got to have. Because, you know, to come in a game like that in a closing situation, whether you're starting the inning or you come in uh, maybe sometimes in the eighth inning, you just have a different mentality about you. But, you know, those two left-handers, as far as closers go, come to mind. And, and uh, they had a little crazy bone in them. Chris, what did that win do for the rest of the season for you guys? Because at that point you were playing a little bit over 500 baseball, but – I think it was Pat Gillick who came out and said, I'm not quite sure if, if this nucleus of the team knows how to, how to put it all together. So that win, what, what did its impact have on your team for the rest of the year? 
Well, I think it had a big impact on it. I mean, you know, any time that you can go through uh, a situation like that and a big win, um, you know, it, it definitely, I think, helped offensively. Um, I think that we, you know, as far as scoring runs, I mean, that was a slugfest. That really was. I mean, the Mariners could hit. Uh, you know, we set the major league uh, home run record, and I think it was the following year, a couple of years after, you know, the Mariners come up and, and they broke it. So, I mean, they had a very good club also. But, you know, to be able to go out there and out slug them like that in a game like that, the home runs and grand slams and everything else, I think it definitely helped the, the club out a little bit. And like I said, offensively, I think that – I think we found our groove after that. I think a lot of guys started getting hot. And, uh, you know, we could score a lot of runs in, a, in, in any given game and in a series. And I think that, that kind of catapulted everything offensively after that game. Yeah, the Orioles could slug it with the best of them in those years, and especially in 96. We just had Eddie Murray on, Chris, and he said that Davey Johnson quietly came to him. I mean, the Orioles are below 500 at the deadline. It was somewhat controversial. The decision was to, you know, kind of go for it. It paid off. 88 wins, wild card, uh, a great division series win against the Indians, uh, you know, obviously a controversial ALCS against the Yankees. But uh, Eddie kind of alluded to Davey Johnson going to him and saying, you got to kind of straighten this clubhouse out. Is any recollection of that? Um, I, I mean, what, what happened be clo behind closed doors between Davey and, and Eddie? But, you know, Eddie was a great leader. Uh, obviously, Eddie had been through, uh, you know, a lot with the Orioles uh, prior to that. And I think that he was a clubhouse leader uh, as well as a uh, on the field leader. And, you know, there was a lot of things that, that when Eddie said it, uh, you know, you you did it. But, you know, I give a lot of credit to Davey also. I mean, if he went to Eddie and said that on a personal basis, you know, that's just kind of the way Davey was. But, you know, I give a lot of credit to Davey. You know, he had a lot of guys on that team um, that, you know, that, that were good players. But he was able to bring everybody together. He was able to pull the right strings and talk to the right people, do the right things. And, you know, we had Davey for a couple of years, and, and I respect Dave Davey for what he what he did, who he was, and he, he was a player. He's an ex-player. And, uh, you know, he's, he'd been there and done that. And, you know, there was a lot of things that Davey talked about and did. That you might look at, you know, you might look a little side-eyed, but, you know, he'd been there and done that. So you kind of believe in him. And we did, and you see where we got uh, two years under Davey. You also had a, a huge season that year for Brady Anderson where he jumped from, I think he would hit like 21 home runs as his previous career high for a season, and then he comes out and, and he hits 50. What was it like watching the, the transformation of Brady Anderson that season? Uh, it was awesome. Uh, you know, as a leadoff hitter, uh, Brady did a great job of, of – uh, getting our offense started. He was a big part of our offense. And, you know, anytime you can get 50 home runs out of your leadoff hitter and you can be one nothing right off the get-go after the first hitter, uh, you know, it does a lot for your offense. But, uh, you know, more importantly, it, it helps with the pitching staff too. You know, it's easier to pitch with a lead than it is behind all the time. So when you got a guy like Brady leading off the game with homers, uh, you know, that definitely helps. But Brady could hit. Brady was a good hitter. Uh, you know, that year he hit 50. Uh, and, and I think after, before that and even after that, I, I'm not sure. I, 20 homers maybe was as high, 21, something like that. But that year, you know, he happened to break out and, and he had an unbelievable year. So offensively, you know, it was nice to follow somebody like that and be in that lineup because Brady usually would lead us off with a, uh, you know, a home run and, and get us out to that lead that, that everybody tries to get to. Chris, just to go back, the Eddie also said that if the Orioles come home 2 nothing in the ALCS in 96, they win the series. And obviously, we know what happened in game one, which, by the way, it's again getting traction. I see like an ESPN documentary on it down the road at some point, uh, the, the Jeffrey Mayer uh, play, obviously, in right field. Uh, what was your vantage point for that play? And, and do you agree that – I mean, the Orioles, people forget this. They came back in one game, two of that series. But you have to believe coming home 2 nothing. I mean, that's a really tough hole to dig out of if you're New York. Well, I mean, my vantage point was behind no plate. 
Um, you know, obviously Tony Trasco had the best view. Uh, you know, it was it, it was disappointing. I mean, obviously, you know, us and the Yankees had our battles through the years, uh, but when you get in a playoff situation, the stakes are a lot greater. Uh, every every move is magnified. Everything that you do is magnified, and obviously, that play was a a, a, a huge play not only for them but but for us. And you know, we did come back and win game two. But I think I, I agree with Eddie. I think if we uh, if we go home two zero. Uh, in front of our fans uh, to Camden Yards, I think that series would have been completely different. But I think that just – I think that took a lot of wind out of our sails. And, you know, when we come home, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what happened. I mean, you know, that team was unbelievable, uh, that team we had that year. And to get in a playoff uh, championship series mm-hmm. like that and just kind of – uh, to lose it the way we did, uh, you know, I, it didn't leave a very good taste in our mouths. But that Jeffrey Mayer incident definitely started at Yankee Stadium. When Tony Tarasco gets back to the clubhouse after the game, what's what's his reaction like? Because uh, he was obviously protesting Richie Garcia at the time, but um, I have to imagine that he was probably just as, just as mad uh, as when that game was over and you guys were all talking about. Well, it, it, you know, he obviously was disappointed. Everybody was disappointed, and he was sticking to, uh, you know, like I said, he, he probably had the best uh, view of, of everybody um, because it happened right above him. But, uh, you know, he was pretty adamant about what happened, and obviously Richie Garcia didn't see it that way, um, and and he allowed it. But, you know, it, like I said, it, it, it just – it was a bad situation all the way around, I think, for us because, you know, we, we had momentum going in. Uh, we felt that we had the best team in in, uh, in baseball, not only the American League, but in baseball. Um, you know, and like I said, it just – it was it was tough to take after that because going into the playoffs, we felt that we were the best team. And, um, you know, that little incident right there, I think, just kind of hurt us a little bit, even though we come back in one game two. Um, the playoffs, like I said, is a different bird. It's it's a different mindset. It's a different uh, – a little bit of everything, and everything gets magnified. And, you know, whenever anything like that happens, it it, uh, it definitely doesn't help you. Chris, I want to ask you about some uh, really interesting and really good pitchers you caught over the years, including uh, Oriole ace Mike Mussina recently going into Cooperstown. Uh, you got to see him from uh, when he was a first-round pick rookie, making it to the club, you know, getting some starts – in 91 and then obviously the year he had in 92 and, and through his time in Baltimore. Uh, like, when did you know, when did you know what you were working with there? Uh, I didn't take very long, Brett. Um, you know, when, when you, when you play the game, as long as you, you have, uh, you know, there's certain guys that come along that are just kind of set themselves apart from everybody else. And when you're catching guys like Musina, um, there's just something about him that, you know, like I said, he, he could hit his spots. His ball moved. Um, he'd go inside, outside, up and down. Uh, his breaking balls, his knuckle curves, his changeup. Um, and then the more I caught him, the, the thing that I think set him apart from a lot of other people is he could throw any pitch at any count at any time in the game. Uh, you know, it could be a tie game with the winning run on third base. Uh, with bases loaded, and he would not be afraid to throw a changeup uh, or breaking ball. So, you know, he didn't rely on his fastball 100% of the time, even though he had a good one. Uh, you know, he was able to throw that knuckle curve. Um, he was able to throw his changeup really at any point in time, uh, you know, in the count. So that's what I think set him apart from a lot of people. To kind of go off of Mucina, you also on that 97 staff, you've got Scott Erickson and Jimmy Key. So you're going Mucina, Erickson, Key, and you're catching those guys in succession. How much easier did that make your life behind the plate, knowing that was the, the, the threesome that you were going to be working with? Uh, it was pretty nice. Uh, you know, when you, when you talk about uh, baseball teams and you talk about pitching, um, 
you know, you, you start with Mike Mussina and Erickson and Jimmy Key, you know, that was at that time, those were three pretty good pitchers on the mound. I mean, they were all three starting pitchers, basically. They could all three been number ones. I mean, when we got Scott Erickson, I mean, he was number one for the Twins. Uh, you know, Jimmy Key, we got, when we got Jimmy, he could have been a number one pitcher. And obviously Mussina was also. So when you have them three backing up, it's kind of a fight to the top to see who gets number one, two or three. And I don't know if there wasn't one, two or three, it just happened to be, you know, you're on Monday, you're on Tuesday, you're on Wednesday. You know, as a catcher, it was a thrill for me because they all offered different things. And, you know, Mike, uh, Mike Mussina was able to hit spots and, and, you know, go deep into games. And, and he was a very, uh, you know, cerebral type of pitcher. Scott Erickson had a nasty sinker, uh, really good slider. And it was kind of a inside, outside, inside with the sinker, outside with the slider type of uh, pitcher. And then Jimmy Key was a finesse guy. Uh, you know, he could go inside, outside, up and down. But you know, they all three possessed different things, but they all three made a name for themselves by getting out and pitching in big games. And, um, you know, it, it was a lot of fun for me to be a part of that. Chris, 1997 ALDS, that same Mariners team, I mean, they are loaded. For whatever reason, the, the Orioles are the best team in baseball that year. Wire to wire, 98 wins. But for whatever reason, I felt like they were underdogs to that Mariners team for all the names we've mentioned. But I think a lot of it to do with Randy Johnson. And Mucina beats Randy twice in four games. How important was that for Mike to get that kind of recognition, you think, to, to outpitch another eventual first ballot Hall of Famer? Well, I think it was huge for Mike because I think Mike had to rap that he was not a big game pitcher, big game winner. Um, you know, I, I, I disagree with that because Mike was in a lot of big games for us. Um, and I think Mike did pretty well. Uh, but you know, I think Mike had to rap that that he couldn't win the big games. And to go up against Randy Johnson and beat him twice, uh, I think we beat Randy five times that year. Um, and I think we beat him three times in the, in the regular season and twice in the playoffs, if I remember right. But, um, you know, for Mike to be able to do that and come back on short rest and everything else, I think speaks volumes for why Mike is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, because he had that ability, that big game ability, and to go up against pitchers like Randy Johnson and beat him in a, in a situation like the playoffs. You go back to that 92 season, and the way Johnny Oates sets it up is he's got uh, Rick Sutcliffe going up against a lot of the other teams opposing number one starters, but he also helped you with, with game calling and, and learning some of the intricacies of of how to do that. What did Rick Sutcliffe mean to your career? Oh, he meant a lot to my career. I think, uh, you know, Sutcliffe uh, and even Johnny Oates. I think Johnny Oates, uh, you know, Johnny, I got to, uh, you know, pay him uh, a lot for my career as well because he was an ex-catcher. Um, just taking me aside and teaching me little things. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's not the big things that, that help you out. It's just the little things. And you have a combination of a lot of little things. And, and uh, you know, in the end, they, they will help you with the big things. And Johnny did that with me. But Sutcliffe was uh, – Sutcliffe helped me out a lot uh, in game stuff. Uh, you know, situational stuff, uh, pitch calling. Um you know, why he did this, why he did that, why he didn't want to pitch to this guy when the numbers may have said that he should have, and he went to this guy. So, you know, it was a lot of that type of stuff with, with Tuck. And, uh, you know, the, the couple of years that we had him and kind of the father figure that he was, you know, Rick had been around for quite a while and had a lot of successful years. And to be able to bring that to the Orioles to open Camden Yards for a couple of years, uh, you know, Rick, uh, I have to owe it to Rick a, a lot about my career on the catching side and game calling side, uh, just because of his knowledge and everything he had been through up to that point. Chris, I have to ask you one more Mucina question. I know it's a game we're going to feature coming up, uh, and I, I, you can make the case it's the best pitch game in Orioles history. Uh, May the 30th, 1997, Mucina against a just unreal Cleveland Indians team, uh, 28 batters. 
uh, to get 27 outs, uh, complete game, and just incredible gem. One of the few times I've ever seen Mike probably show emotion on the mound after a game when he, I think, struck out the final two batters that night. Uh, you were behind the plate. You caught that shutout. Uh, any recollection of that night from you seeing it, how dominant that performance was? Yeah, I mean, Mike Mike had that ability. And like I said, uh, you know, that's this is why he's in the Hall of Fame because he – when Mike pitched, Mike would always get in the zone. And, and you hear that a lot. But if you if you don't really know what that means, it's hard to explain. But there's times where you would see Mike on the mound and once he got through that first couple innings, uh, you know, unscathed type of thing, he seemed to really settle down. And it didn't matter if it was the Indians, the Mariners, the Yankees. It didn't matter the lineup. Uh, you know, he knew he knew how to pitch and he knew how to get hitters out and he knew how to go after hitters. And very seldom did he make mistakes. But that night was just unbelievable. I mean, everything was on. Uh, where he wanted to throw the ball is where the ball went. Um, you know, we had great defense out there behind him also, but Mike, you could just tell him, Mike, you could just look in Mike's eyes that night. And it just, there was something special about Mike that night, that night. Um, you know, he just, he had it going on. It wasn't anything that he couldn't throw at any time. And like I said before, I mean, that's, that's what Mike made Mike, Mike, he could throw anything at any time. And he definitely had them guessing that night, and they never figured him out. It certainly helps when you're, you're catching somebody like a, a Mike Musina, but uh, when you're behind the plate and you're trying to figure out a game plan for some of the great hitters back in, in the time where you were catching, uh, who is the guy that when he would come up to the plate, you realize that this guy is going to be pretty tough to, to get out? And, and who is the one that maybe as you were, were trying to figure out the, the game plan for him that was the toughest to, to plan against? <laughs> There's quite a few of them, but uh, I, as far as Messina goes, if that's if, if that's what you're talking about, I mean Frank Thomas. Frank Thomas just wore Mike out. Um, it didn't matter what Mike threw, where he threw it, uh, he could throw a ball that was going to go out of the stadium. But, <laughs> but uh, it, you know, a funny story with Mike. We we were actually playing the White Sox and. Uh, I think we had just played him uh, a week or two prior and Frank just tore him up. And so when we, we went to Chicago, Mike's like, he's going to invent a pitch. And I'm like, well, what pitch are you going to invent that you don't already have? Uh, he said, I'm going to throw a knuckleball. When Frank comes up, he said, I'm going to throw a knuckleball. Okay. Well, first of all, I don't have that many fingers. Uh, because when Mike pitched, I used like, every finger, head nodding, fastball, head nodding for a cutter. Uh, you know, uh, I would circle my finger for uh, a sinker. Change up is four. You know, I didn't have enough fingers. But he invented a – he threw a, a couple knuckleballs to Frank that day and actually got Frank out a couple times with the knuckleball. So, uh you know, as far as me seeing it goes, Frank Thomas, you know, Sandy Alomar seemed to hit uh, Mike pretty well. I think uh, I think Sandy actually is the one that, that broke up a couple uh, possible no-hitters uh, for Mike. But, um, you know, like I said, everybody has their own. It's, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's like Randy Johnson. I mean, Randy just absolutely tore the league up. Uh, until he come to until he played Baltimore and what it was about the Orioles at that time, uh, you know we had guys like Jeff Rebelly that just tore him up. You know I I had pretty good numbers off of uh, Randy. Uh, there was I think it was one I don't know if it was in the playoffs or regular season with Davey. He sat guys like Paul Merrow and B.J. Serhoff and all of our you know well known lefty hitters uh, to play guys like. Rebel A and and those type of guys and like I said I I don't I'm, I'm not sure what year it was I think it was '97 when we beat Randy five times, uh, but you know it's just when you face guys like that they they're good for a reason they're in the Hall of Fame for a reason, but they do still have their kryptonite and some guys do get them and have really good numbers off of them. Fastball to fastball, uh, Randy Johnson. Armando Benitez in his prime. I mean, who 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 do you remember, whether it was catching or hitting, 
that just had that most explosive velocity. Well, Randy, Randy was uh, Randy had the velocity, but he also had the deception. I mean, the guy's what six eleven or whatever, and he would short arm the ball, and you know he had to he had a, a slider to go with his fastball. So, you know, when he would stride, he'd almost be in the grass by the time he you know pushed off the rubber at six eleven. So, you know, uh, you know, guys like that, uh, Randy, uh, Pedro Martinez, uh, you know, Roger Clemens, you know, they all. Facing those type of guys, you just hope you can come out of there with one hit. Um, you'll take you one for three or one for four. Hopefully you get a walk, and then you wait for the number two, three, and four, and five guys uh, in the rotation. Hopefully you can get multiple hits off of them. But like I said, they're, they're, they're good for a reason, and uh, those type of pitchers, uh, they know how to get guys out, and they have the stuff to do it. How did you maintain your offensive consistency for so long where you're – you're hitting 20 home runs a season. You're driving in lots of runs because it's not easy to do when you're behind the plate every day and, and you get to those Baltimore summers where it can get pretty high. Well, I think it was a conditioning part. I mean, I, you know, off-season conditioning, uh, spring training, you maintain it. Uh, during the season, you know, I lifted. I was a big weightlifting type of guy. So you try to maintain it, but you're right. I mean, the summers of Baltimore, you know, I had my injuries throughout my career, and I think, uh, as Brett and I talked about prior to the show, I think that that had a lot to do with some of my injuries because, you know, I played every day, and I think the Baltimore Heat is probably one of, uh, you know, one of the worst heats to play in. Uh, you got the heat and the humidity, and as I told Brett, I mean, it could be 90 degrees in the outfield, but behind home play, it felt like it's 120, 130 because there's no wind uh circulating there but uh it was it wasn't easy it's it's tough and you know i had the mentality i wanted to play every day and whether it was you know hot cold or whatever you know a lot of times a lot of years it took me a, a, a you know a month and a half or so to to heat up but you know about the middle of may into may is when i started to heat up and and i had managers that uh you know were willing to stick with me and, you know, the final, after my career was over, you know, I ended up being a 262, I think, somewhere around there, hitter. So, you know, I had to heat up pretty good after the first month and a half or so uh, to get to that. But, you know, playing in Baltimore is not easy. The heat, humidity, and playing every day, it, it wears you out. It takes a lot out of you. What's a more memorable feat, Chris? The walk-off grand slam against Seattle or two grand slams in one game? against Cleveland a few years later? <laughs> I have to pick one? Yep. Uh, do you have those baseballs, by the way? Do you have those baseballs? I do. I do. Actually, it's, uh, it's hanging up in the house here, and I got the bat and got the two baseballs, um, and I even got the uh, 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 one of the tickets to get in the game uh, along with it, so I had them framed. But I – I don't know. I, I think that uh, both of them are, are uh, a feat uh, amongst themselves. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the whole cliche of the three, two count, two outs, you know, bottom of the ninth and all that, uh, you know, that, that was pretty special. But the two grand slams, uh, you know, I think at the time I was, I think the ninth player or something to do that. Um, I think that one probably had a little bit more meaning for me because at the time I had had my hip problems uh, and I wasn't playing, uh, able to play every day like I was before. So actually that was a first start, I think, in a few days that I actually got. Um, so to go out there and do that on a day like that, uh, especially, uh, you know, my mom and dad was there, a lot of family members. Ohio. Uh, so, yes. So to be able to do it in Cleveland and, in that setting, uh, at that time, uh, I think that one was probably the most memorable one for me. Chris, in your career with the bases loaded, you had 77 plate appearances. You drove in 75 runs, <laughs> and you hit into only one double play. How do you have that much success, and what are you telling yourself when, when you come up and the, and the bags are packed? 
There's my speed. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it wasn't anything like, uh, you know, that I actually told myself. I think, I think the biggest thing for me is I was able to, uh, you know, a lot of guys don't have success uh, at those times because they, uh, you know, they get worked up about it. And I didn't really get worked up about it. I kind of was able to, to calm myself and, and take the situation in and try not to do too much. You know, a lot of guys try to do too much. Uh, I didn't. I just wanted to get a base hit or a walk and get on base and, you know, get a free RBI if I could. So I think I was able to try uh, to not do too much and, and just relax within that situation because really, I mean, the, ultimately the pressure's on the pitcher. He's got to give you a pitch to hit um, somewhere along that at bat and you just hope that you don't miss it. So, um, yeah, I don't even know. I, I don't even know how many grand slams I had in, in, in my career. I, eight, nine or so. I don't even know, but, I was able to have bases loaded and, and do a lot with that. Um, you know, I think just by being able to relax and take the situation in and try try not to do too much with it. In a 10-year career, Chris, you are part of so many important moments in Orioles history. Final game at Memorial Stadium. You know, you're the starting catcher of first game at Camden Yards. Uh, I even mentioned 21-30 and 21-31. You go deep in 21-30. Uh, I always felt, I don't know if you remember or agree, that those two nights were the probably two best games the Orioles played the entire 1995 season. And I, I'm sure that team kind of felt disappointed, I think, you know, basically a 500 team. But uh, but those were the two best games. I mean, whether it was Erickson the one night or Messina the next night, uh, all the home runs that were hit, including yours, you know, Cal going deep twice. Uh, that always They just played the 21-31 game on ESPN again. Uh, it always amazed me how good you guys looked those two nights. Well, we did, and I think the magnitude of it, I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of buildup of that, obviously, uh, and it was a huge feat. Uh, there should have been. But, you know, not only for uh, the city of Baltimore and Baltimore fans, but really the – I'm going to say the whole world. I mean, it was a lot of uh, – you know, there was a lot of reporters there. Uh, there was a lot of people there. A lot of coverage, uh, so there was a lot of lead up to those uh, two games, and uh, and especially the night when when Cal broke it. So you know, being able to go through it with Cal, and and just kind of live it on a daily basis. I think those two nights, it was just one of those exhale moments where it's finally here. Uh, it was definitely within reach, and you know, all that lead up and everything else. It's just. Uh, sometimes it's a detriment because you want it to, you want, it's kind of like Christmas morning moment. You want it so bad that you just hope that you can get to that moment without anything happening. And when it finally does get there, I think we're all able to just relax and have a good time and take it all in. And, uh, you know, happy for Cal, with, you know, getting to that point. And uh, I think we all were just able to, to exhale and enjoy the moment, not only for ourselves and being part of it, but for Cal. We asked Bill Ripken about this. Did you ever uh, get to observe uh, Cal's uh, superhuman healing powers? Because he had to battle through quite a bit of stuff when, when he was playing, and he always managed to be in the lineup every day. Yeah, I, I mean, being alongside Cal for, uh, you know, my 10-year career, I mean, uh, you know, I was able to, to see a lot. And a lot of times I was in there with him, you know, either from the night before or, you know, something else. But – yeah, I think that that was my mentality also. I wanted to play every day. Uh, I definitely didn't get the, the number of games that Cal did. Uh, but I think that was a cool thing about a lot of the guys that we had. Uh, that was their mentality. I mean, Brady was in there every night. Uh, Paul Merrill was in there every night. Uh, Alomar and B.J. Surhoff and, you know, myself, I wanted to be in there every night. So, you know, I think we had that mentality and we were pretty good at we figured it all out. And, you know, we were able to, to be pretty good uh, at the same time. But, you know, being able to watch Cal and go through his thing, uh, yeah, we saw some injuries. And, and uh, you know, he did the right thing, go, on, go in and get some treatment. And the trainers, uh, you know, they did a great job. Richie Bansells and, and uh, you know, his staff did a great job. 
And but Cal could play hurt. There was a lot of us that could play hurt. Um, we couldn't play injured, but we could play hurt. And you know it, that that was just our mentality, and definitely Cal's. Last one, Chris. Uh, settle the score. The biggest brawl in your time with the Orioles was it the '93 one we were talking about with the Mariners, or was it that famous one years later? with the Yankees uh, that seems to get the most attention. And, and that was a ridiculous brawl when you think about, you know, guys getting leveled into dugouts and stuff. But uh, which one was more ferocious? Well, I, I think they both had their moments. But, uh, you know, I would have to say the Yankee one probably is the biggest one for me, uh, you know, just because of the way it went down and Marquis Grissom hitting the home run and, uh, you know, and then Tino getting hit in, the, in between the numbers. And, um, you know, it, there was a lot of things that went on in, in that one. You know, I ended up getting – because I was a catcher. Um, you know, I ended up getting pushed into the camera well on the third base side. Uh, you know, and then Strawberry and Alan Mills. And, you know, there was just a lot of kind of subplots that went to that fight. And I think that one was probably the biggest and probably lasted the longest. Yeah, that one went on for a while, and that actually got pretty dangerous, and it was also, like, in the Bronx, and it just felt like the crowd was egging it on a little bit. But uh, that one will live forever. There's no, Both of those will live forever. Uh, Chris, we really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much going down memory lane with us. We hope you and your family are, are well and safe in this time. I appreciate that, and thanks for having me. That is Chris Royals. Thanks, Chris. Great stuff from Chris Hoyles. We really enjoyed that conversation. Uh, But folks, Nurses Week is May 6th through the 12th, but we'll never stop honoring and thanking you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you will do. Thank you to every MedStar Health nurse and all the nurses around the world. And two examples of this, manager of quality at MedStar Family Choice is Suzanne Moxham, and she was asked to help with a child who was behind on his immunizations. He couldn't be seen by the family's primary care provider because the office was closed due to the coronavirus pandemic. Suzanne researched the case and found the child had only completed one round of shots. Her experience as a nurse, Suzanne says, meant she was not going to just tell the family to wait. She reached out to one of our practices near the family's residence and helped schedule a new patient appointment to begin the process of becoming current with necessary immunizations, our MedStar Family Choice team continues to oversee the child's progress. And then, Brett, you have nurse Jessica Dell is our patient care services coordinator in the emergency department at MedStar Harbor Hospital. She's known for being creative and providing a safe and healing environment for patients and members of her team. She takes an active role in retention and recruitment and cares deeply for the emotional state of her fellow caregivers. In light of the challenging emotions facing frontline providers in the emergency department, Jess took it upon herself to make small care packages for each of the department caregivers. It's really cool. The packages included an inspirational message, a stress ball, and some candies. She wanted to give her staff a reminder of the heroic work that they're doing by giving them a something little extra to make them smile. Brett, that is why nurses are so great and they need to be appreciated every day for all the things that they're doing. Amen to that, Jeff. Another uh, group of special people that we should acknowledge, it's a day late but not a dollar short, and that is uh, all the mothers out there uh, because yesterday, of course, Mother's Day, so I want to say happy Mother's Day to my mom and happy Mother's Day to my wife and to all the moms out there. Uh, Jeff, I know you echo those sentiments. I certainly do. I want to wish a happy uh, Mother's Day to my mom. And as a Mother's Day present, um, she's we're, we're loading her up with a little bit of Orioles stuff. Uh, I got her a, a Orioles hoodie uh, the other day, which which she can wear around and uh, which you'll uh, definitely need on some of those cooler nights uh, during the summertime and uh, as well as in the fall. I am uh, very happy with uh, the present I gave along with my two beautiful daughters uh, for my wife. But you know what my wife really wanted? And she's going to get this, and that is two hours in solitude. And <laughs> I don't think in a time like this, being quarantined for all these weeks uh, together as a family, one could ask for anything more. I said to myself, as a father, what would I want? 
and that would be a few hours to myself. <laughs> so that gift to my beautiful bride and uh, to the mother of my children. So uh, I, I came through big with that. So uh, happy Mother's Day a day late. A lot of great podcasts coming up for us. So keep checking us out here on Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite. Jeff, until next time. Stay safe, my friend. You too, buddy. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Thanks.